This is what God loves. Today, my message is entitled, God Loves a Giver. God loves a giver. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verse 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 7, rather, says, each one of us must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. And I want you to say this with me, everybody, out loud, real loud, for God loves a cheerful giver. So God loves a giver. So let's talk about that. God loves people um, who give. There are other versions of this uh, verse that I love. It says, God loves those who are happy to give. God loves the one who gives gladly. God loves a hilarious giver because the, the Greek word for uh, cheerful is hilario, the word we get hilarious from. So when you find something hilarious, it comes out of the core. Like when was the last time you had a really good belly laugh? I mean, like slapping your knee, crying, you know, snorting, inappropriate snorts, you know. Uh, it just, as something hits you, and it's so funny, it just comes out of the, the middle of you, and you can't control it. That's literally the idea, that God loves when we can't help ourselves from giving. It just pops out of us. We just, we're just so excited to give. And I look at that, and I say, I, I want to be a hilarious giver. I, I want to be a hilarious prayer person. I want to love prayer and not, all right, God, it's time to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. All right, are you happy now? No, I don't want to, I don't want to pray that way. I don't want to sing that way. All right, I guess one more song. I mean, we had to do four songs. I guess three wasn't enough. So here you go, God. Here's my song. No, that's not, that's not what we're going to do. I want, I want worship and prayer and and witnessing to people, sharing my faith with my neighbor, loving my neighbor. I don't want to do any of that uh, from, a, from a place of, you know, frustration or duty or obligation. I want to do that. I want it to bubble up outside of, out of my innermost being. I want my giving to do that. I want it, Lord, I'm praying over my gift. I'm, I'm sowing this seed. Thank you for everything you've done. I love to give. Thank you, God. That's what he loves. He loves it when we live that way from our heart. But the truth is, if we're brutally honest in how busy we are and how stressful life can be, and we look at our checkbook or our credit card balance and we go, I don't know, and then it's time to give, it, or if our neighbor needs something and we don't have time, each of us have those moments, or I should say maybe we have the nature that we don't always want to be generous. We don't. If we're honest, there are times, lots of times, where giving is annoying, uh, doing good is annoying. We don't, we're not set up for that. I don't have room for it in my day. I'm not there in my head. And so I wonder if we could spend a few minutes examining ourselves and saying, why would it be that I would not be hilarious in my giving? What is it, what is it about my life or my nature that doesn't want to do this. I don't want to talk about giving. I don't want to write the check. I don't want to do that. Well, there's, there's three things that I can think of just right off the top of my head, and it's that we could be too serious, we could be too scared, or we could be too selfish. We could be too serious in that, you know, we're all so calculating, we're good at math, you know, we look at our budget, <clears throat> we want things to add up, and we just say, you know, I I can't do it. We can be very serious. Everything is an intense calculation for some of us, a deep decision. And I think too often we're in our heads. We're asking reasonable questions. Can I afford this? Is this a worthwhile investment? Is this going to be properly used? What is the strategy? What is the strategic value of this gift? Do I agree with the strategy and how they're going to use this money? Is this scriptural? Did God really lead me? All fair questions unless we use those questions to avoid generosity. So let me give you an example. Uh, you've all, how many have heard about the Maui fires and the terrible suffering that's going on over there? It's in the news and, you know, it's a, 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 tra a tragic thing. I mean, hundreds of people lost their lives and 
then you know you think about the Haiti earthquakes and all the things that are going on. N name a disaster where it would be great if we would be generous to help people that are struggling and hurting, right? Now here's, how, here's what can happen in our head. Who's gonna be in charge of how that money's given out? Where's it gonna go? What are they actually gonna do with those? Is this their fault? I mean, should, shouldn't they really have had a better infrastructure? And you know, wh why have so many people died? I mean, you can use your head so much that you will talk yourself out of generosity. And that is a problem because it, it's okay to use your head. It's good to use your head. God expects you to use your head, but he doesn't want your head to stop you from doing the things that he loves. So think it through and then do something generous. How many understand what I'm saying? Don't just stop on the, well, I'd like to see their, you know, their ratings and their reviews. I'd like to see how many stars they have on, you know, uh, Investorpedia or whatever it is. No, that's all good to know that. But at the end of the day, if we're, if we're not generous because we're so in our heads, that's a problem. It's called paralysis of analysis. And it sets in and it keeps you from loving God. Your brain is not a problem unless it stops you from loving God. The other issue is that we might be too scared. I mean, think about it. Fear is everywhere, especially the last few years. Social scientists and psychologists and pastors are noticing this, that people are off the chart with anxiety. We've been through so much. I think part of it is, you know, we were talking between the service. I think part of it is how, they, how the news just blows everything up. You know, it's like we're living in constant fight or fright. Somebody was even saying to me today, well, I, you know, Maui, I mean, the whole island's burned, right? You can't go there. I said, no, you can go. You can, it's like a two square miles out of an 800 square mile island that you can still go. I said, please go to Maui. Please spend your money there because all those people need the help and they're freaking out right now in Maui because America thinks that the whole island is blackened and you can't go there. And, it, and why is that? Because the news... Just showing you a certain picture, just saying devastation, devastation. But they're not showing you the rest of the island. And that is so true for how life works. The news, if you're too into the news, you're getting nothing but the worst side of everything. You would think that the wheels are going to fall off of the universe. That everything is terrible. The schools are terrible. The nation is terrible. And I know there's problems, but it's not everything. But they're blowing up certain things, right? And so we live in constant fear that the wrong people are going to take over and America's going down the tubes and the church is going to be irrelevant and nothing's going to work and the next generation's going to be destroyed. It's, you're, you're looking just at the problem instead of the whole picture. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? And that's why people are stressed out and fearful. So we have to, I think we have to step back sometimes from the devices. Hello? Oh, three amens on that one, huh? <laughs> oh, you love that phone. You love that Instagram. You love that. Be careful because it's toxic. And it, it's a, if it's a nonstop diet of this or that, it puts your body and your mind into fight or flight. And, and you're living stressed out. And so you don't have time to love your neighbor and you don't have time to help at church and you don't have time to give and you don't have time to share your faith because after all, the, the sky is falling, literally. The world is coming to an end. Can I give you some good news today? The sky is not falling. God is in control. I just talked to him this morning and he told me he's Lord of all. He's in control. He told me that he controls my destiny. That's right, yeah. I wanna validate. Listen, if you're suffering, if you're, if you're going through hard times, I'm reading the book of Job right now. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's like you can't wait till you get to the end, you know, but the, cause it was, I mean, it was so painful. He went through so much and stuff happens to good people. Bad stuff, right? But the end of the story is God makes it up, and he gives him twice as much. And I want to validate your pain. If you're going through a hard time, your family's being rocked by something, or you're hurting, or you're, 
you, you know, you're, you're having struggles. All of that is real. But I'm telling you, you're not going to stay there. God's going to get you to the end and it's going to be good. He's going to help you, right? So the fear and the anxiety will shut us down. And you know what? I'm, I am sick of living with fear. I am sick of living with anxiety. Anxiety has not done one thing for me. It has never helped me have a good day. It has never built my family. It has never helped my finances. Anxiety, fear, depression, all that stuff that the world is just shoving down our throats through every conceivable channel, that is not helping me. Here's what helps me. God is in charge. And God has a plan and he has an answer. So I'm gonna be obedient and I am not gonna let fear keep me from blessing other people. I'm not going to let fear that I'm not going to have enough keep me from honoring the Lord. God's the one who keeps his promise. God's the one who gave me what I have. What do you think I got what I got? Right? So, so watch the fear. Watch the, you know, the brains. And then watch out for the heart because we could be too selfish in this. If we're not really flowing in generosity, it could be that we're struggling with uh, selfishness. Now, <clears throat> I have a, I, I don't want to brag, okay, but I am like, <laughs> I am so good at being selfish. It's not even funny. <laughs> like, I don't even have to practice, literally. I don't have to try. It just flows out of me. That's right. That's right. Don't you wish you could be like me? but you are like me. <laughs> Nobody had to teach any of us to be selfish. We all like what we like. We like things to go our way. We like when we say something for somebody to say what they're supposed to say back. We like when we do something for somebody to do what we expect them to do after we do what we do and then they're supposed to do what they do. Only they didn't do what we expected them to do and that's And we like things to go a certain way in our day. We like our food prepared a certain way. And it never happens the way we want it to happen. And that's why we're angry and grumpy all the time and stressed out. Because if it would be like if there was a throne in our heart, we are sitting on that throne and we are commanding the world to do and go the way we want it to go. And it never does because we're lousy at being the king. But when Jesus sits on the throne and we're at the feet of the throne and we're looking to him saying, how would you like it to go? How can I, what do you want me to do, right? Then the joy returns, the happiness returns because the weight of the world is no longer on our shoulder and we realize, get ready for this. I know it's gonna shock you. We are not the center of the universe. Jesus is. And to the degree, you know, your unhappiness, my unhappiness, my grumpiness is a direct reflection of how tightly I'm clinging to the throne of my life. If you want to be happy, if you want to have some positive vibes in your life, let go of the control, let go of the power, and let go of your money. Trust God, right? It doesn't mean you shouldn't be a good manager, but it means stop trying to hold it all together. God's word strikes at the core of why we sometimes struggle to love God through generosity as we should. Proverbs 21 says, some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. Now, the godly love to give. That is, in other words, when you're truly like God, you, you get pleasure out of giving. You give that gift and you wait for the person to open or you, you, you bring that offering to the Lord and you wait with excitement. You're not mad that you had to give or that somebody brought up giving, right? So I know what you're thinking. Hey, I didn't come to church for this today. I don't need this. Uh, this is Memorial Day weekend. We need something better than this, David. 
we, we, need, we need a message that's going to be, but, but here's the thing. We've all believed the, the lie of the enemy, which is that the greatest things in life are things. But the greatest things in life are not things. The greatest things in life are the things of God. And so that will, that will help us with our selfishness and our seriousness and our, and our fears and our scares, and it will lead us to becoming hilarious givers. So I want to be a hilarious giver. I want to discover what is the secret of these things. Get rid of those negative uh, patterns in my life and really become entrenched in the positive pattern. How to seriously become uh, a person that generosity flows. I'm not just talking about on Sunday. I'm talking about seven days a week that we're generous. And Paul nails it. The passage we read when we began, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that verse is a part of a big passage that I want to read to, to us, and I want to, I want to throw the light of the Holy Spirit upon this passage and really cause us to, to grab a hold of what God is saying here. I'm going to read to you from the passage translation. It's verses 7 through 10 of the ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians. How can we become, how can we love God through generosity from our heart? Okay, Paul says this. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving, all because God loves hilarious generosity. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of everything, every moment and in every way. He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do, just as the scriptures say about the one who trusts in him. Here's what it says. Because he has sown extravagantly and given to the poor, his kindness and generous deeds will never be forgotten. The generous, this generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals, is even more extravagant toward you. First, he supplies every need, plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. This, is a, this passage is drenched with insight and wisdom that can help us you know, do the right thing with money, be generous with God, be generous with our neighbor, and, and really allow it to come from our hearts. So let's, let's break this down. Let me give you four things I notice in this passage. Number one, we should learn to give because it pleases God. If we're giving for any other reason than to please the Lord, it's not correct. Our hearts have to be engaged in a goal, which is, Lord, I want to put a smile on your face. I want to live for you. I want to give, I want to pray, I want to, anything and everything I do, I want to do it, not because I have to do it, I want to do it in order to please you. It's like what you would do for your grandchild or your wife or your favorite friend, if you give them a gift, you're not, you're not going for the mugs and the tea towels, right? You're, you're going for that thing that's going to put a smile on their face and go, oh, that's unbelievable. What a beautiful gift. And you bring pleasure to that person. That's the real heart of giving. And that's really the heart of our message. We want to give because giving please, pleases God. God loves a giver. And so inherent in this is an, it's like an act of worship. Pastor Kerry said it earlier. It's really true that giving is a part of our worship because worship is doing what we do our whole life in order to please the Lord. And it's a powerful truth that if we give, it draws us closer to God because it pleases him. It shows him that we want to please him. And what's the consequence of wanting to please and doing things in order to please the Lord? He's going he's gonna to be so close to us. Now, <clears throat> I'm a specialist in helping people be close to God. That's my ministry. But I also can help you with your marriage. And I also can help you with your friendships and, and other 
relationships that are important to you, none as important as your relationship with God, but this principle actually applies to every relationship in your life. Let's say that you're struggling with somebody and it's not going well. You wish it could go well in your mar- better in your marriage or better with your son or your daughter, or your neighbor, or your friend, your team member, or whatever it is, and you, you'd really like to make things better. It's amazing how a heartfelt gift can impact a relationship. When you give to somebody, when you, so ge- when you show generosity towards someone, it's very honoring. It's very uh, thoughtful. It, it shows, hey, I'm invested in this relationship. So guys, you know, go out and buy something for your wife, okay? Don't wait for her birthday. And all the ladies said, <laughs> I knew I could get an amen if I just said the right words. Just say it a certain way and you can get an amen. Um, it, has a, it has a powerful impact. I, um, <clears throat> I love the, I love the uh, quotation. That, well, let me give you this for your notes. First of all, relationships improve with generosity. Now, that doesn't mean that a gift is going to solve your every problem. You also need to stop acting like an idiot. That also helps your relationship. There's other things. So don't just give the gift and say, well, I gave a gift and they didn't do anything. You know, it, it's, it's not as simple as that, but a gift can be a powerful thing. One of my favorite teachers, um, he's in heaven now, and, but you can, you can find him on YouTube. He's awesome. Derek Prince, uh, one of the greatest teachers, I think, of the, the last century in the charismatic church. He, after his wife died, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a quote that a friend of mine told me about Derek Prince. He asked him, um, do you have any regrets? Your wife is, has died now, and how are you doing? Do you have any regrets? He said, I do regret that I didn't waste more money on my wife. What a powerful thing. What was he doing? He was, he was, he was saying, I am so careful sometimes. I'm so budget conscious, so reasonable sometimes that I held back. And now that she's gone, I would love the opportunity to be a little foolish with my money and waste some money on my wife. I think that's the way we should look at giving to the Lord and loving each other is that it's going to be okay if we give just a little extra because we want to take that opportunity to Uh, to really do that which will please the person that we love. So that's number one. The second one is, um, I see here in this passage that God wants us to give from our hearts and not from our heads. He said, Paul said, let giving flow from your heart. Let, Let hilarious joy spring up as you give. And like I mentioned before, a, a, a good hilarious belly laugh. It's just, it, it's something that's coming from the deepest part of you. And that's such a great way to live, you know, laughing that way, but also loving that way is great, right? Giving that way, worshiping that way. There's so much inside of us that it needs to come out. And Jesus said, when you receive the Holy Spirit out of your innermost being, will come rivers of living waters. That precious baptism of the Holy Spirit, that beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives unlocks our generosity, it unlocks our worship, it unlocks our giving, it unlocks our testimony with our neighbor. Maybe the missing ingredient for you in your life today might not be generosity, it might be the the baptism of the Holy Spirit where where the power of the Lord goes wham right into the innermost being and you stop living this Christian life from your head and you start living it like a river of living water that's coming out of you and the worship leader says lift your hands and I say I don't want to I don't have to Uh, okay you don't have to that's fine Uh, it's time to give I don't want to I don't have to everything's a everything's a task it's a chore but when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're like, yes, let's sing another song. Yes, let's pray another prayer. Yes, let's, uh, let's share our faith. It's like a river coming out of you. How many want the river of the Holy Spirit to come out of you? I'm telling you, 
Don't seek to be generous. Seek the Holy Spirit. Seek the Holy Spirit to unlock all that stuff that's locked up on the inside of you. God, I don't want to love. I don't want to give. I I don't want to worship. Why? Because I need the Holy Spirit. And, and God, I need your spirit and your presence to whack me, to unlock my everything that's on the inside. And once you have that, giving and smiling <laughs> and worship is not a problem. Even on your worst day, the Holy Spirit was, is so faithful. He'll be there. You'll find yourself so stressed out with whatever's going on in your life and you're looking at it and you're going, I should be losing my mind, but I kind of feel like smiling. I, I kind of feel like... God's in control, and, and I actually have joy. You know, my, my father just died, or my friend is sick, or, or whatever it is, and it, there's so much happening at work, and this is going on, and that is going on, but I'm actually aware of good things in my life, too. Let me tell you, because there's so much stress in Silicon Valley, and so much stress in the world, we all feel it, we're all fighting the time thing and the money thing and the, you know, all the politics don't help and the, just all the pressures of life and just trying to keep up sometimes can be overwhelming. Me too, I get it. I mean, I, I'm not like, a, I don't walk, you know, 12 inches off the ground. When bad things happen, I feel it. And bad things happen in my life and hard things happen and all of that. But here's a secret I've learned. You go to bed and you're stressed out and your mind is just spinning. You know what I'm talking about. It's spinning about that conversation or that thing that happened or that bill or whatever it is and you're just spinning until you finally go to sleep. Stop your mind from spinning by doing this. Try to think about what happened that day that was really good. If you had a good cheeseburger, stop and think. You know, that burger was really good. Um... You know, my wife said something that was really smart. She's smart. That's good. That's good. Um, I did have an answer to prayer. I did have a beautiful conversation with somebody. There were four negative conversations, but I had one really good one, and it was so uplifting, and somebody told me that God healed them and answered their prayer, and, and you, you start correcting the record. You correct the record that your life sucks and that there's nothing but stress going on. You correct that record right before you go to sleep. And then you wake up the next morning and you go, today's gonna be a great day. Because I just had a great day yesterday. I mean, there were some tough things, but actually I think tomorrow's gonna be a little bit better. Even Job, in all of his suffering and pain, knew that he could thank God and it was gonna come out okay. So. Thank God and believe that it's going to come out uh, okay. None of this is in my notes, and I really have no idea where I am. (laughs) So let me just think about it. Okay. Give from your... (laughs) Belly laugh is what got me going. (laughs) Give from your heart, not your head. Jesus said, don't store up treasures on earth. Moths and rust can and destroy them. Thieves can break in and steal them. Instead, store up treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy them and thieves cannot break in and steal them. Your heart will always be where your treasure is. Your heart is connected to this thing right here. And so when you put this thing into your marriage, you put it into your relationship with God, you put it into the things that are important. You're actually connecting and deepening yourself through uh, that money. So don't say, Lord, ask me for anything, but don't touch this. Give this to God. Because this really reflects where your heart is. You say, well, I love the Lord, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not a giver. No. Uh, I love Jesus, but I don't give. You can't really say that. Jesus said, if your heart is in it, your money will be in it. Number three, break free from religious obligations. I love that. And I wish the church could talk more about that. Paul said to give not from a sense of religious duty. It seems like churches just want to put duty on you. Constant religious duty. But Jesus said, "Ah, let me take the burden off of you. These Pharisees, man, they're loading you down with rules and regulations. I'm just giving you two. Love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. That's That's it. 
Jesus is trying to lift the obligation and duty. He wants us to serve him freely and lightly. And so let's do that about our giving. It's not, you know, we're not giving because it's a duty. All right, God, here, throw your dollar bill in, you know. Dude, keep your dollar, you know. Uh, it's okay, you know. Um, God didn't give out of duty. He gave out of love. So give like he gives. For God so loved. He so, he so loved that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish. But have, how many are glad that he so loved the world? He didn't love the world system. He didn't love all the injustice and corruption and hatred and racism and greed and violence. He doesn't love all that. He loves the people. And he said, these guys are locked up in sin. They're, they're lost without me. And I don't, I don't want to be without them. I want them to be with me. I want to love them. I want to free them so I'll give. He didn't say, oh, that's a great mess. Good job, guys. Way to go. Screw up the world. And then look to me to bail you out. Sure, that's not what he did. That's not God. And it shouldn't be us. We should help each other and love each other without getting grumpy about it. And let it flow from our hearts. You know, we are most like God when we are giving. He's a giver. And here's the last piece. Become a hilarious giver by doing it because God loves it. Do it to please him. Give from your heart, not just your head. Break free of the religion and the formality of it. And then the final one is trust God's promise to, the, to you when you give. The joy is that... <clears throat> You know, you're going to part with that gift. You're going to give the money or give your time or whatever it is, but God's going to bring it back to you. Like that's, <laughs> that's the fun part. You're not going to go without, you can't outgive God. When you give to God, he will always give you more back. And Paul said it, he said this, the scriptures speak about the one who trusts in him. God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you're always going to have more than enough for everything. He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing. God loves a giver. So expect the, the blessing to come back, the, the abundance. Jesus said, give and it shall be given. Men will give back to you, right? And he said, what you give determines what you get back. It's amazing, the abundance. But then it also brings happiness. Then I'm going to close with this thought going to pray. And I want to pray for you if you're feeling a f far from God or you're, you're feeling troubled or you're going through a Job situation, we're going to pray. But let me just close with this thought. If you want to be really happy, learn to give. Because Jesus said this, it is more blessed to give than what? To receive. Now that word blessed is the, is the Greek word happy, makarios. It means to be happy. He said, you will be happier when you give than you receive. And it, it is so true. There's so much stress and pain and sorrow in the world because our hearts aren't where they need to be. Our hearts need to be generous. If we are keeping track of too many details, we're gonna lose our joy. But if we just give and trust and live life like a child, the way Jesus said we should, we're going to be happy. How many want to be happy? Three people want to be happy. That's great. You thought I was going to say, you thought I was going to say something negative at the end, right? It is more blessed, more happy to give. And so let's, let's please God. What's the message today? God loves a cheerful giver. He does. He loves a giver. And let's ask the Lord to align our hearts with that 
great thought. Lord, I thank you for your word. Your word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. Thank you for the reminders, Lord, that the pain and the struggle and the sorrow and our selfishness and our weakness and all of all those things is not really the answer. You are the answer. Lord, wipe us clean today of all the stuff. We've picked up the news reports and we've picked up the stress and we've picked up the sorrow that is in the world. We give you everyone and we give you everything. We lay that all down and we just ask for the, the gift of the Holy Spirit to fill us with the, the life and nature of Jesus, your very nature, Lord. Let us become givers and let it flow from the core of our beings, Lord, to bring life to the kingdom of God, to bring help and support to the people of God, the church, to those that are suffering. Help us to be givers, Lord. We can't do it all, but we can start today. And Lord, if there's somebody that we're struggling with, help us to, to find an act of generosity, of kindness to, to bless them with, Lord from our heart, not for an effect, not for a transaction, but truly to change that relationship. And now, before we close the service, I just wanna pray for anybody who just feels far from God. You, you're not sure you're okay with God. You're thinking about your sins, your failures. You're thinking about the messes you may have made. And you're realizing, man, I need, I need God. I need a savior. I need a father. I need God's help. The good news is you can receive it. And I want to pray for you. And if that's you, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You want me to include you in my prayer right now? Just lift your hand and say, yeah, please include me in your prayer, pastor. I want to, I want to surrender my life. Yes. Thank you. I, want, I need God. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, over on my right, looking over to my left, two, three, four hands. Wonderful, thank you for that. Thank you for, that's okay. You don't, okay, you can put your hands down. We, we're not ashamed. We're not afraid to ask God to help us, forgive us. That's where our life begins. And it's amazing how fast a simple prayer can change things. So Lord, right now in your house, we surrender everything to you. We ask you for the gift of new life in Jesus. Forgive our sins, heal us, and make us the children of God. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, Lord, that was for me. That was for me. Come on, Jesus, that's, that's my prayer. I'm your child. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. I love each and every one.